Hello and welcome to webinar Wednesdays from the Deep Carbon Observatory. My name is Katie Pratt and I'm part of DCO's engagement team based at the University of Rhode Island. This webinar is brought to you by Engagement and DCO Synthesis Group 2019. It's my pleasure to introduce Hao Zhang, a data scientist and PhD student in computer science at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Hao is also a research assistant in the Tetherless World Constellation, working as a data scientist and application developer on a number of research projects, including the Deep Carbon Observatory and the Deep Time Data Inter Infrastructure. Hao is currently pursuing his doctorate in computer science, advised by Professor Peter Fox, and his research interests span data science, policy awareness, the semantic web, artificial intelligence, data integration, and privacy by design. Now, for a bit of housekeeping before we get started, the presentation portion of the webinar should last about 25 minutes, followed by 15 minutes or so to answer any questions you may have. If you have questions during the webinar, please feel free to use the chat function at the bottom of the screen to type your questions. At the end of the presentation, Hal will answer the questions in the chat before we move on to open Q&A. If you have your webcam turned on right now, please turn it off. You can turn it back on during Q&A if you would like. So with that, I'm pleased to sign off and turn it over to Hal. Thank you, Katie. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today. My name is Hao Zhong, and I work at the Tetris World Constellation at RPI. I've been part of the Beast Carbon Observatory Data Science Team for roughly three and a half years, and it has been a great pleasure to collaborate with many of you from several DCO communities. Today, this webinar will kick off our summer webinar series on data science in geosciences, presented by the data science team of DCO at Headless World Constellation. The whole series will cover selected parts of the data science workflow in the order of data acquisition, data processing, and data analytics. And for today's webinar, we'll discuss data acquisition for geosciences. Data is the raw material we find or create to gain an understanding of the domain. This understanding can be gained through exploration, organization, or analysis. This understanding usually originates from data and progress it iteratively towards information and knowledge. Information can be gained by interpreting the relationships and patterns that exist in the data. And knowledge is in turn obtained when the patterns and meanings in the information can be learned by a larger audience. Such a progression of human understanding is not always linear, but constitutes what we call a data information knowledge ecosystem. In this talk, we are concerned only by the first part, the data particularly the creation and gathering of the data. Over the nearly past century, enormous amount of data has been produced, archived, and published across the geoscience community. Development of experimental devices, analytical tools, as well as scientific methods have been the driving force underneath the accelerated increase in quantity and improvement in quality of geoscience-related data. In recent decades, such exponential growth of data has uncovered new data-intensive approaches toward research questions that were once before unsolvable in the absence of not in the absence of enough data and even encouraged the pursuit of many new discoveries. Therefore, data science has become unprecedentedly instrumental in geoscience research. While numerous highly quali high quality and comprehensive data sources are made available for geoscientists, such as ERCCAM, MINDAT, BAMS, PETDB, etc., many challenges still lie in areas such as dark data acquisition, integration, quality management, processing, analytics, and so on. Understanding the, and adoption of suitable data science practices throughout the data lifecycle cannot be emphasized enough in order to maximize the utilization of existing data and unleash the full potential of data-driven discovery in geoscience. 
For today's episode, we will discuss data acquisition in geosciences. We will focus on two main aspects of data acquisition, namely data rescue and data access. For data rescue, we will feature a special running example of the legacy thermodynamic data rescue accomplished by the data science team in the recent years. For data access, we will demonstrate a couple of examples on how we can obtain well-curated and integrated data from several existing data sources. In the end, we will be able to have these acquired data ready and loaded in an analytical environment for further processing and exploration. First, let's ask our question, what's data acquisition? Traditionally, data acquisition is the process of measuring the electrical or physical phenomenon such as voltage, current, temperature, pressure, or sound with the computer. Traditionally, there are three modes of acquisition, observation, measurement, and generation. Data acquisition missions are usually motivated by curiosity in questions, are used to supplement or prove a theory or hypothesis, and usually come along with exploring new ideas. This is one of the simplest examples of data acquisition by observation. A person who wants to understand the punctuality of CDPA buses so that he wants to have an idea of when the bus will actually arrive at the bus stop rather than the official schedule. By observation, he collects data about arrival times of buses at a certain stop. And such observations are limited to a number of challenges such as interference of other buses, missing seeing a coming bus, calibration of his watch, as well as unanticipated metadata and procedural mistakes. Besides observation, we also acquire data by measurement. For example, we want to research the properties of a colored plastic film by testing the relative intensity of the wavelengths in the white light source through that film. We can use a special tool called a spectrometer to measure at the relative intensity of this light. It's connected to a computer and records all the values by using a software program that interacts with the device. And the result of this measurement activity cannot always be perfect. It might be affected by external noise, inexperience with the software, and etc. Data, when not directly observable or measurable, needs to be generated. For example, in order to explore how severely the 2008 mortgage crisis impacted major financial firms. We generate the weekly highest and lowest stock price of chosen financial firms in a time range around 2008. One will need to query and filter the data in order to get the result he wants, and sometimes computation is also needed. Here, the quality and representativeness can be affected by factors such as uncommon company changes, lack of metadata, and sometimes our choice of sampling rules can be biased too. Beyond the traditional times, however, we ask, is data acquisition just observation, measurement, and generation? For the information era, data also come from re reusing existing data sources, which have already been collected by traditional methods. These resources can be commercial or research-oriented. They can be well-curated and integrated or can be scattering around and less organized, or could sometimes be hidden deep in hardly accessible sources. As far as data science or geoscience is concerned, we here consider data acquisition as a broader and more general phase. It represents a phase, usually a starting phase, in the data science workflow, where researchers acquire data from existing sources which are traditionally by observation, measurement, and generation, and in the information era, data acquisition can be broadly categorized into acquiring well-curated data, as well as dark data. Now, the name of dark data might sound somehow chilling and ominous. Intuitively, one might relate and think about the dark web, where all sorts of evil information and transactions are hidden underneath. Well, we can rest assured that dark data is not, in that sense, the same thing as the dark web. 
Dark data generally refer to data that exist but are not readily available, easily accessible, and directly usable. It can also refer to digital information that were curated, however, that were left out and not being used. They are usually unconstructed, unstructured, not machine readable, and can be incomplete. Dark data can be dangerous for some business, but for geosciences, more often, dark data can be wasteful as vast amount of potentially useful information can be hidden in the dark and can be endangered as they, store, they are stored in forms that makes preservation of data difficult over time. These dark data are also referred to as data at risk. These heritage or legacy data could contain observations or measurement that were collected a long time ago for specific studies and are in analog forms such as papers, books, films, and tapes. In times, these data legacy are not only valuable for research, but also unique and non-replicable. They contain observations or measurements of terrestrial, geological, biological, or astronomical object systems and properties as seen sufficiently long ago that they can contribute critically to studies of how things have changed over time. Data Rescue offers an opportunity for digital repositories, including institutional repository, data archives, and scientific data centers to provide access to potentially valuable scientific data that is at risk of being lost. Rescue may be valuable not only to restore access to data of past scientific interest, such as environmental observations or social surveys, but also to recover historic information about the state of knowledge and science at the time the data was collected or assembled. As part of the Deep Carbon Observatory Data Legacy Missions, the DCO Data Science Team and Extreme Physics and Chemistry Community identify thermodynamic data sets related to carbon, or more specifically, data sets about the enthalpy and entropy of chemicals as a proof of principle analysis. These legacy data sets are contained in geoscience literature published between 1930s and 1980s and not expressed externally to the publication text in digitized formats. Extracting, organizing, and reusing these dark data sets is highly valuable for many within the earth and planetary science community. These data sets contain three main types of data, which are heat and enthalpy data determined by two types of calorimetry and direct determination of heat capacity using differential scanning calorimetry. As you can see from the right-hand side, the original data are recorded in ancient fonts and not of the best scanning quality. The tables have multi-layered and hierarchical titles which implies difficulties in digitization. The information was also organized in inconsistent format due to institutional and temporal difference of the research. The DCO data science team endeavored to develop a semi-automatic workflow, which includes identifying relevant publications, registering metadata about the data, extracting contained data sets using OCR, which is optical character recognition methods, collaborative verification and reviewing, and finally, deposit of the data sets via the DCO data portal. The data science team implemented a data rescue workflow model using a workflow management platform called Trello. The team has been actively using this platform to ensure the execution of a data rescue workflow since 2015. As you can see, the implement of the workflow has five phases, including collection of the publications, metadata, and then data sets, followed by data set review and data set deposit. Each individual rescue task is managed by a card, which can move freely back and forth along the pipeline. Using these cards, tasks can be assigned to different team members and can be reassigned again for different phases of the rescue. And team members can paste links, upload attachment, check their completion, and also comment to each other.
the core task of data rescue extraction of data. Throughout the, the comparison, the data science team purchased a commercial software called PDF to Excel to facilitate this extraction. As you can see on the screen now, it's a demo of how the data science team used the software PDF to Excel to extract data from legacy data, uh, from legacy papers. On the left-hand side, a data curator opened Excel spreadsheet. On the right-hand side, which is the PDF to Excel software interface, the, the data curator opens the legacy paper. First of all, the data curator will locate the pay tables in the legacy paper, and then he switched to the left-hand side in his brush Excel spreadsheet and entered the title of the table, the unit, and the column names. And then he switched back to the right-hand side and in the interface of the PDF to Excel uh, software, he chose the area where the data locate. And then PDF to Excel will be able to enable a process in which the user will be able to check each data point one, one by one and correct mistakes. As the user finished correcting all the OCR mistakes, the content of the rescue data will be copied to the system clipboard, and then the user will be able to paste the result into the Excel spreadsheet. And using Excel functions such as find and replace, uh, and other Excel functions such as maximum values, lower values, the user will be able to further clean up the rescue data and then paste the rescue data into the area where it should be in the rescue table and the rest data rescue process is complete. The VCO data science team registered the data sets via the VCO data portal where the linked data feature of the data portal provides a mechanism for connecting rescue data sets beyond the individual sources to research domains, BCO communities, and more, making data discovery and retrieval more effective. To date, out of 85 publications by 43 main authors, the data, BCO data science team has rescued 84 data sets containing thermodynamic properties of 184 carbon-related compounds and minerals. Other than the thermodynamic data rescue, starting 2017, members of the data science team, Fang Fong and Fei Fei Pan, also started a project rescuing diamond datasets containing in heritage publications. Thanks to the newer and more consistent publication format, font, and scanning quality, the team developed a more automatic extraction pipeline. In this process, Tables and figures are extracted as separate files from original PDF files. These extracted tables are then put through optical character recognition using Adobe Acrobat. With OCR results saved along with the tables in PDF format, a small chunk of code can transform them into CSV tabular format and ready for verification for, verification for result. Being able to use batch processing in table extraction OCR and transformation to resolve tables effectively reduce the unnecessary human labor so that the team can focus on result verification, which still remains labor intensive. As the data science team performed data rescue as one of our boundary activities, we also explore what we consider the best practices of data rescue. Practically, there's no unique the best practice as data rescue relies on a number of considerations and is subject to a number of requirements and goals. For example, qualities, quality of raw data, as shown in the previous examples, can, be, can determine the extent of which batch processing and more automatic methods can be implemented. The labor and commercial software 
cost of data rescue need to be considered along with the value of the raw data too. While the amount of the raw data and extensibility of rescue methods can also affect cost in the long term. Therefore, while there exist general guidelines, data rescue best practices varies in practice in order to promote availability of correct, complete, and trustworthy data that are easily accessible and directly usable. Just now, we saw two examples of rescuing data from dark data sources. Next, let's also take a look at how we can directly access data from well-curated databases. A good number of well-curated data sets and databases has been set up within the geoscience community. There are MINDET, Roth IMA, EarthCamp, of course, DCO Dataset Browser, as well as PaleoBioDB, the Protein Data Bank, BAMS, and many, many other sources. Today, let's, how, let's see how we can access well-curated data from Roth, EarthCamp, and of course, the DCO Dataset Browser. Roth is a project that aims to create a complete set of high quality spectral data from well characterized minerals and to develop the technology to share this information for mineralogists, geoscientists, gemologists, and the general public. The Roth project website contains an integrated database of Raman spectra, X ray diffraction, and chemistry data for minerals. In partnership with IMA, that is, the International Mineralogical Association, Ruff also created and maintained the IMA database of mineral properties. In a Ruff IMA list, a user will be able to choose freely one or more of the 5,200, more than 5,200 IMA approved minerals, either manually or by filtering using certain search conditions based on their chemistry. The database can output several different types of data sets on these minerals. It will be able to output all the physical and chemical measurements of information on these minerals. What's more amazing is that it can provide all evolution data from its mineral evolution database, which contains mineral observation data with associating ages and locality information. The user will also be able to choose output option to include or exclude certain variables to their own preferences. The EarthCamp portal offers a one-stop shop for geochemistry data of the solid earth with access to complete data from multiple data systems operated by different providers. The portal returns integrated search results from the federated database such as PetDB, ZDB, GeoRock, NAFDAT, USGS, Darwin, and etc. The portal features mapping and visualization tools too. So here on the EarthCamp, after we log into the EarthCamp portal, one can choose many, many search filters for this search. For example, it can search the geological location. It can search, it can enter certain range of chemistry component. And the user can even choose where and where he wants the data to be from. And after he click next, the user will be able to go to click the button to access the data. And before accessing data, the user are even able to have their choice in choosing uh, options such as sample display, file types, and the columns you want or he doesn't want. And after you click, go to data, the page will let the user download the data, and here's a sample output on the left-hand side of the screen. It shows all the metadata, as well as location and all the measurements. Finally, there's DCO Dataset Browser. You, one can easily find the DCO Dataset Browser if you go to the DCO website and click the DCO Data Portal and go to, go to Dataset Browsers as shown on the left-hand side screen. After you go into DCO Dataset Browser, 
on the left hand side, user will be able to filter the result by conditions such as publication year, creator, DCO community, teams, project belong to, and data type. A user can even go to the search bar above the result and enter certain keywords, such as, for example, a user can want, the user want the thermodynamic properties of silica, then he can enter silica, and the result will be filtered. And if the user goes to the result, the result not only show the metadata that's stored on the DCO data portal, but it also offer a direct access link where the user can simply click on it and download the data set. From the existence of dark data scattering in the legacy data, from the existence of dark data scattering everywhere to the best practices of data rescue, to the convenience convenient access of well-curated and integrated geoscience databases with come far. Data from its humble and primitive existence as a result of traditional acquisition nowadays has become available and accessible to the science community as well to the general public. The eventual goal of data acquisition, as we mentioned before, is to make data usable and in a way machine readable. For example, the rescue that thermodynamic data along with the DCO dataset browser has made the data useful. For instance, we're interested in the thermodynamic properties of polymorphs. Polymorphs are compounds that have the same chemical composition but different crystal structures. For example, graphite and diamond. Groups of aluminosilicate and silica polymorphs can be discovered along among the rescue data sets. And here, if we obtain the data of these two polymorphs from the DCO dataset browser, data can be easily loaded and be visualized as a first step of exploration of interesting patterns. Time flies by fairly quick. Today we discuss data acquisition as the first step of our data science workflow. We discuss several demonstrations on acquiring geoscience research data by rescuing dark data, as well as directly accessing data from well-curated data sources for the community. In a subsequent series, my colleagues from the data science team will share on data processing, data analytics, as well as other options, technologies, and best practices of data science in geosciences. And again, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, Ha. So we have one question in the chat um, and I'm going to, we'll start with that question and I'm going to unmute everybody on the call so that you can feel free to chime in and talk to you how. <laughs> so the first question in the chat is, how accurate is the OCR software? The, the accuracy of the software largely depends on the quality of the raw data. We switch to the slides that contains the legacy data sets that we have spread across the 1930s to 1980s. Generally, I, the data science team, we didn't do a summary, but as a first impression, the later data sets are easier to have correct results through the, through the OCR web software than the earlier ones. Sometimes the earlier ones can have, up to the OCR can still have 40 to 50% of error, while the later ones, especially the ones that's already digitized when they are scanned, can have much higher accuracy. And as, the data, as, as we talked about another slide, the data rescue not only requires data to be rescued, they also need the data to be correct, complete, and trustworthy. And for that purpose, that requires data, that requires for the data rescue a huge amount of human labor. Even we have a data set that's OCR 
to be 95% or even 99% correct, we still have to use human labor to go over each data point to make sure the data we provide are 100% correct for scientific discoveries. Thank you. Thanks. And um, another question from the chat is, um, what's your best guess as to how many data sets have been rescued by the data science team so far? So for the data science team, so far we have done two data rescue activities. One is the thermodynamic data. One is the um, diamond data rescue. Um, each one of them, can, uh, for the thermodynamic data, there's 84 data sets currently rescued. Um, each data set actually just represent one legacy paper. While in each paper, there are multiple, there could be multiple tables. And together, there's data of uh, 184. Um, for data rescue, I don't have the summary statistics right here. Um, if you're interested, I can try to contact my colleagues later um, to find out the correct uh, summary statistics. Great. Thank you, Hal. If anyone else has any questions um, and you are muted and would like to be unmuted, you can click the raise your hand button at the bottom right hand corner of the participants tab. So let's just see if anyone has any questions. It doesn't look like it. So um, if anyone does have any follow-up questions for Hal, um, just feel free to um, email us through engagement at deepcarbon.net and we'll make sure Hal gets your questions. Um, we hope you can join us next month uh, when Mark Parsons will present on adopting RDA technologies into the DCO data portal. That mm -hmm. webinar will take place at 2 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday the 13th of June. So, like I said, if you have any questions about today's topic, let, let us know. Or if you'd like to suggest a future webinar or series of webinars, please let us know. You can email us at engagement at deepcarbon.net. So, thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.